So good morning. Welcome to our Upskill Works Forum series where we engage business and community leaders, policymakers, and leading thinkers on the key workforce issues our region and nation confront. I'm Peter Beard and I lead the Greater Houston Partnerships Upskill Houston Initiative that partners with employers, educational leadership, and community-based organizations to strengthen the talent pipeline our region's employers need and to help Houstonians connect to good jobs that increase opportunity and prosperity. Before we get to our guest, I wanna do several things. First, I'd like to share with you some important perspectives about what we're seeing in Houston as it relates to the COVID pandemic. Second, I'll review a couple housekeeping details and acknowledge the underwriters of the Upskill Works Forum series. As many of us know, we are all seeing the local and national news reports and looking at the data coming out of the Texas Medical Center regarding the surge in COVID-19 cases in Houston. We talk with TMC leaders on a daily basis and their tone continues to be one of serious concern as they begin using their ICU surge bed capacity. While we, were seeing, while we are seeing some positive trends in the rates of infection and hospitalization, we cannot let our guard down because the actions we take today and tomorrow have a direct impact on where we are two weeks from now and into the future. The easiest way to protect your family, your friends, and coworkers is to wear face masks, maintain appropriate social distance, and wash your hands frequently. And now for those housekeeping details. All attendees are muted and your video is turned off for the entirety of the webinar. Please do not use the chat function for questions and answers for our panelists. This will not be moderated for questions. The chat function should be used to connect with our production team if you're having any issues. If you have questions for Marsala and Ian, you should use the Q&A tab at the bottom of your screen. This will be moderated. I'd also like to acknowledge the sponsors of our 2020 Upskill Works Forum series. The Greater Houston Partnership and Upskill Houston would like to thank our gold level sponsors, Houston Community College, the Merrick Family of Companies, Texas Mutual Insurance, and Winstead PC. Our civil, silver level sponsors are Accenture, AT&T, Centerpoint Energy, HCA Houston Healthcare, Lone Star College, and San Jacinto College. Thank you to our sponsors for your support of the Upskill Works, Upskill Houston's efforts. I'd like to introduce Sabra Phillips, who, is, who serves as the Director of Talent Development for Merrick. Sabra will be introducing today's session and our guests. Welcome, Sabra, and thank you to Merrick for its leadership in this region and for being one of our gold level sponsors of this series. Good morning. Thank you, Peter, our fellow sponsors, and all of you joining us today. Uh, the Merrick Family of Companies is proud to be a partner with Upskill Houston and support these virtual sessions on important workforce topics in our region. As Peter mentioned, today we'll be discussing reskilling and economic mobility. The changing nature of work is disrupting career pathways into good careers, particularly for middle skill workers. And as we've all been experiencing, COVID-19 has accelerated this change, affecting the education and the skills needed to be successful in the, work, in the workplace, both today and in the future. Today, we'll be exploring how our region can come together to help individuals identify and navigate new career pathways toward economic opportunity and mobility. We're especially fortunate to discuss these opportunities with a senior fellow at the Brookings Institution who has an extensive history of taking on issues surrounding both poverty and developing prosperity, Marcella Escobari. Joining Marcella is her colleague, Ian Sayal, a research analyst and program manager at the Brookings Global Economy and Development Program. A little bit more about Marcella. Marcella leads Brookings Workforce of the Future initiative and has made a career of researching and working to address critical issues around poverty and economic development. She has served as the assistant administrator for the Bureau of Latin America, the Bureau for Latin America and the Caribbean at the U.S. Agency for International Development and as the executive director at the Center for International Development at Harvard University. In 2013, the World Economic Forum named Escobari a young global leader. Her recent work with Brookings explores three areas. One, how cities and regions just like Houston can attract growth and nurture good jobs. Two, how skill building organizations and policymakers can measure and target skills needed by emerging local industries to help workers transition effectively. 
And finally, how companies can use data on worker transitions to retrain and prepare their workforce for the jobs of tomorrow, as well as invest in their workforce to benefit their communities and bottom lines. Last year, Marcella and Ian published two reports. First, Growing Cities That Work For All, which uses data analytics to inform city policy, inclusive growth, and skilling strategies, and second, Realism About Reskilling, which leverages data to highlight realities of low-wage work and maps realistic pathways to economic mobility. Marcel and Ian, welcome. We're so glad you're here with us today, and we're really looking forward to an insightful conversation. Peter, I will turn it back to you. So thanks, Sarah. We really do appreciate the support of Merrick and its leaders like you, Mike Holland, and Stan Merrick. Marcel and Ian, thanks for taking time today. So let's jump into our conversation and just a quick reminder to our audience that we'll respond to questions viewers submit by the, by the Q&A function at the bottom of your screens. So as you have questions for Marcella or Ian, please feel free to submit them. And I'm now gonna turn it over to Marcella to kind of set the context for today's discussion. Marcella, thanks. Great, let me try to share this. my screen can uh, can you let me know if this is working looks good from our end marcella great do you want me to get started peter yeah, or go ahead um perfect well thank you very much uh, for uh, for having us we're very excited to join you, Peter. Just for the record, in this kind of new world of, of Zoom, this is not my library. I am on vacation in somebody else's house, but they had a perfect Zoom background. But if you see any you know, weird books, they don't reflect my tastes. But uh, anyway, uh, we're really excited to be here. I, we wanted to kind of break this conversation based on some of the questions that Peter has sent us um, that, um, that kind of frame a bit of our research, and uh, and I think what we're what, what we'll try to do in this in this hour, probably last the first 20, 30 minutes, is kind of go through our research and and uh, and through our methods and what try to explain what does it mean for policymakers and and for companies, and we'll also try to show you some um, some data about Houston, but this is very preliminary and things that we hope that you know, you can help us interpret in the future, but, um, but we'll show you a bit of data on that. So, so I wanted to start, I mean, when I think about what our research does, we're, we're, we're trying to answer, you know, three buckets of solutions that we're trying to inform at the city level. And, and most importantly, try, and try to align them, which is, you know, how do you grow and how do you create better jobs? And in this, you know, post COVID world, really is how do you recover from, from a contraction and, uh, and build back better. The second bucket is how do you help workers transition to these middle skill jobs, to higher paying jobs. And even though for today, you know, the, the many, for many more, the question will be, how do I get back into the workforce? And, um, and third, you know, what are the policies that make these transitions possible? Affordable housing, transport, affordable childcare. And in some ways, these kind of institutional scaffoldings that you need to achieve economic mobility um, have in some ways become more pressing in this COVID world when you think of affordable um, transport or any transport or childcare that really um, will require in increased ingenuity in, the, in this time. So, you know, while these are thorny policy issues, um, even without a contraction, I, you know, we think that there also might be opportunities uh, that open up with new sources of funding, with changes in the way people are doing business in, the, in, this, uh, in, in this world of policy. But what we're trying to provide is a bit of very data-driven, place-specific answers to these three questions and stress the, the interdependencies between them. So we were gonna start with the first bucket, bucket which is how Peter uh, you know, posted to us of like, how do you think about growth? How do you think about building back better? Uh, how do you, you know, the, the, the man side of the equation? Um, how to create jobs? 
And, uh, and so here I'm going to go a little bit far off to show you kind of how we think about that question, which, um, which we think is still quite relevant in a COVID world, because while some industries will be, will, you know, will suffer and, uh, and contract and some businesses will go away, I think uh, there will be opportunities not just to recover, but to build back and build new industries as, as, as you do so. So let me go a little bit through our methods of how we try to answer this question of how do you grow. And our, our methods are informed by my, my work at uh, Harvard Center for International Development, where I work with, with Ricardo Hausman, who pioneered a lot of these measures of economic complexity, but uh, trying to explain that across countries and uh, trying to explain the diversification paths that different countries uh, use and have experienced. And then we try to apply that to, to US cities. So again, when you're thinking of the demand um, of good jobs, you know, we're talking about what are the, what are the industries that you currently host? Because they're the ones that create the demand for jobs. And you might be saying, you know, that's fine, but why are you showing me this, you know, Jackson Pollock painting with, you know, <laughs> lots of colors? So this is actually a lot of data um, that exists, that already exists on, um, uh, on trade patterns that is organized in a way to understand the kind of path dependency of growth. And let me explain it a little bit and how we've adapted it to city. So this is actually a picture of a hundred and the, the data of the trade patterns for 70 years of 128 countries, a thousand products, where every node here is a product, right? So on the right, the green blob there is garments where every dot is, you know, shoes or shirts or socks, you know, the dark blue is machinery, you have car parts, you have, you know, airplanes and, and so on. Um, and each, each product is connected to its nearest neighbor by the probability of their co-production. That means that if you export a certain product, given this you know, 70 year of history of trade, it is also likely that you export the node, that product that is, um, that is next to it. So this is kind of, this, this network is organized by the probability of co-production. So two products are close by. If again, the probability of a country that makes you know, shirts for men means that it is also likely to make shirts for women. And then that means that these two nodes will be together. Now, um, if the probability that a country that makes shirts for men and shirts for women and also makes microwaves, which is the light blue cluster on that left side is not high, then those products are going to be uh, far apart. So again, this becomes a map of the inherent capability that a place has uh, that is shared by certain products. And there's, let me just share a couple insights that come from this picture. One is that growth is path dependent. So if you have certain capabilities in your environment, you have a port, you have, you know, good logistics, you have X weather, you have X talent, you know, that is what will determine what products you can host and what kind of, and, and what you host today, because it tells us something about the capabilities that you have, will tell us what other products or industries are likely to thrive in your environment. So it shows us that, that the, that the um, process of growth is, is path dependent. And, uh, um, but, but obviously that you can, and that there's some products that are more advantageous or more central in this network that you need you know, a lot of capabilities to make that are also shared by other, uh, by other products and others on the periphery that might be good complex products, but that they don't use capabilities that are shared by other industries. And the last point I'm gonna make here is just kind of call your attention to this uh, big uh, dark um, node on the top, which is, which is oil. And here the size of each node is the size of international trade. So obviously this is a really big industry that I don't need to tell you all about. Um, and very complex industry, requires very complex inputs, but it's not shared by other industries that use the same inputs, which is what makes it hard to diversify out of an oil economy. And, and again, this is something that Houston knows well and it has done incredible strides to, to diversify. Um, 
but certain products, as you think of diversifying, again, become more strategic than others. And just to show that at, on the world level and the work that we did with Ricardo at, at, at Harvard, where I spent almost a decade, you know, we were doing this to try to explain the, what products countries have give you a and the complexity of those products give you a perspective of their future growth. So we were able to predict the future growth of different countries and don't look too closely at this graph because in a post-COVID world, nobody is growing, but uh, uh, this was kind of the expectation given the inherent capabilities. And in a way, we think that it, those inherent capabilities will stay even in, in recovery. But this is just to show that part of the equation was to predict growth. What was most interesting to us was really is how can countries who might be stuck in products that are you know, not as complex or have, uh, uh, have difficult diversifying could change their path? What strategic moves toward products that were close to them that would use their existing capabilities um, um, but would push them to a more, you know, uh, more complexity? What would be that path that would get you out of the poverty trap, which was what we called getting stuck in certain products that uh, did not tend to deliver that? So that's the goal, really. And this is the last, you know, weird networky graph that I'm going to show you. But what we did is just this is the the the, the networks that we used to try to apply it to the U.S. And the only uh, relevant thing here is that because we had data at the industry level, not just at the trade level, we could use both services and products to look at what we call now the industry space. Um, and also, um, so we were able to include all industries at the, at the metro area, moving this pro international product space to the industry space. space. And we also added another um, network, which I think will be important in the second part of our conversation when we talk about reskilling, because it incorporated the occupational makeup of each industry. So we can say now that industries are similar and what determines uh, like what industries are likely to emerge based on what you have is not only this network of co-location, but of occupational similarity, right? So, and this is kind of intuitive that, um, you know, industries tend to emerge that share, um, that share occupation. So if, um, if you think of, you know, Amazon and Microsoft and Seattle, if, Amazon, 60% of the workforce is computer scientists. It wouldn't be surprising that, uh, that and other industries that also share that um, the, those capabilities, the, those occupations would tend to emerge. So we use these two networks, co-location and occupational similarity to give us even a better predictive capability of what's likely to emerge when we think about uh, US industries. And what we did in this, uh, report that Peter talked about going cities that work for all is um, oops is we um, we um, measured the um, the complexity of every uh, every MSA every county and thus every MSA in uh, in the US and for each one we tried to for 926 you know, metros and 300 industries, um, we try to find out where, um, what industries were likely to be feasible based on the current pattern that existed of, 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 uh, of industries that existed in that place and which ones were complex. And let me show you a little bit of that, um, of that, uh, uh, of that, what that looks like a bit for Houston. Uh, Peter, I just want to make sure that the concept of, of capabilities is clear. I don't know if there's any questions that you might have. No, I mean, I think going back to the, the previous slide, the, I, for here in Houston, kind of the industry co-location, for example, would be our petrochemical industry with our industrial construction industry, that they're co-located for a reason. But if you then took the occupational cut to it, the petrochemical industry, which is a process manufacturing approach, would have similarity to something like breweries or food, food production where you need processes to take place. And so what you were looking for, I think, was the capabilities that have similarities that allow other industries to show up. Is that a, f a fair way to describe it? I, I, absolutely. That, uh, you know, yes. Yeah. I mean, you said it better and more applicable. Like when we think of 
you know, flowers and asparagus, right? Uh, which is not a great example, but both of them require a cold storage change to be exported, right? Yep. So if you, the fact that you see one product means that you have that set of kind of complex capabilities that allow a product that makes X, Y, Z to, to, to be competitively produced and sold. And what we see is that, you know, competitiveness and we can infer the, the capabilities behind it. And as you move away from a certain product, you have to add a few added, you build on the existing capabilities and you add new ones, like you're talking about the petrochemicals, right? And that opens up other parts of the, of the product or industry space as you kind of move, diversify and invest in your capabilities. And I think the other, the point that I wanted to make on the second network of, of talent is just that, which we could not, we didn't have this data to look at at the international level is the importance in talent in also being a determinant of, of, um, of the competitiveness and the ability to host these complex industries. So I know you share with me these great news from, from uh, Harrison that the governor had approved an investment, even in these times of, of crisis, in reskilling and i think the places that are able to get ahead of the curve and really think about you know the industries that might grow might be able to 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 recover um faster and attract things that uh, that others might not so it's just this this these two sides of the question some capabilities are people and some capabilities are are the infrastructure right and going back to your earlier point and you can get ready on the next slide is you know you talked about our energy industry if you take it only from kind of the extraction point of view that's a certain capability but at another capability you've got energy companies that are doing you know thinking about how would we actually shift and do carbon recapture and other things which would be adjacent capabilities but we could build off of kind of the engineering expertise and knowledge that exist within that industry right right and yes and in a way um if you know, we can see what the data tells us of adjacency. You and the folks in different industries know exactly what those means. And, 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 and the conversation with policymakers is about, okay, what capabilities are public goods, what are private goods, and how do we work together to create those so that we can, you know, have these, these industries thrive in, in a place. You want me to move on to this yeah, uh, go ahead. further, you know, more little dots on a, on a page. Um, so, so what we see um, here, as I mentioned, there are, um, I mean, I think that, um, let me explain this graph. I mean, I think if there is one takeaway from our work on complexity is that, you know, one, one size does not fit all. And we want to give each city, and we provide the metrics and the uh, and 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 different metrics at the city level just to to show what might be in each individual city's path, right? And these are two metrics that we show here that we think are important when we're thinking about growth. And then again, they help prioritize, you know, scarce public dollars when it comes to creating and supporting these capabilities. So one is this question of feasibility, and feasibility is what's close to your current productive structure based on the output of, uh, of this metric. And the other one is um, strategic, in the, well, this is, here we have complexity, and what we know about complexity is, uh, is that uh, cities and places that are more complex tend to, tend to be associated with with uh, with faster growth, um, and here what you see with 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 Houston is that actually, you know, Houston tends to be less complex than one would expect given its size. Right, it's the sixth largest metro in the U.S., but it ranks 84th in terms of complexity. But it doesn't mean that it doesn't have a lot of opportunity, and I think that that I think is the 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 challenge and the opportunity here. The dark dots are industries, a bunch of different industries for Houston in terms of what is strategic, what is feasible, and what is strategic. And the light blue is the same set of industries for Dallas. So what you can see with Dallas, which is, you know, slightly more, more, more complex and diversified, is that the things that are very feasible are also very complex, right? And the, their, their diversification path is going to be around, uh, around those natural industries that are already very complex. And that's the case with a few of the more complex, large places. There are places that look the opposite, 
And these are smaller struggling cities that everything that's close by is very, um, you know, simple, not complex, and that they have to make very few bets to try to move up. And it's, you know, but it's against the curve. The most complex things are further away from their current structure. Uh, Houston is in the middle in that it actually has a lot of complex, it, it has a certain complexity, but the complex industries at the same level of feasibility go, you know, across the board in terms of complexity. So I think there's a lot of opportunities, but you in a way can be quite strategic about uh, trying to add complexity as you think uh, of being purposeful with your, um, with, with the capabilities that you build. And a dimension to that would also, Marcella, be around, you know, building out additional capability as, as, as we know, automation technologies and digital is becoming a, a reality within any industry. And the, the stronger we make our kind of innovation and tech capabilities will actually assist us in being more complex, correct? Right, right. And more so if we can tack to certain industries. I mean, I think it, that, that, that built on what you currently have and all of those are, to be honest, quite, quite close. I mean, and this is stuff you already know, but from this data, you know, Houston, um, has pretty complex industries in finance, headquarters, business services, computer and peripheral equipment, satellite communications, and there are others that are nearby that also exist. They're just could be a little bit stronger compared to other places, um, you know, where opportunities exist in scientific R&D, industries you mentioned, you know, computer system designs, advanced manufacturing, et cetera. And, but, you know, there's a lot more analysis that can, can go there. But the last, uh, picture I wanted to give you, at least on this issue of complexity and growth, is uh, uh, this one that just shows uh, the, the um, a series of cities from Texas around two, you know, a matrix of complexity, how complex are your current industries today? And again, this, this, this measure of strategic gain, which is how many industries are nascent in my economy, but are close by, but if I were to have them, but they're, but how complex are the industries that are close by? And that if I were to have increased strength in these industries, they would share capabilities with other complex industries. Yep. So in a way, a strategic index is a measure of your promise, right? And what we see is that Houston is not, you know, there, there's other, um, cities that are more complex, but the strategic gain, which is like the opportunities to grow are, are high. Good. Does this make sense? It does. No, and it's helpful because I know it's gonna really lead into the heart of the conversation about the impact this has on the workforce. As we think about our capabilities in terms of what we have in terms of being able to market ourselves, but also then attract these other businesses, correct? Correct. So do you want me to move on? Yeah, um, I mean, I think what, you, what you're gonna move into is what's happen, happening structurally within the labor economy, which is in some sense, kind of where we have been focused on the middle skills, it's getting squeezed where you either go up the spectrum or you go down the spectrum. And I think you're gonna show kind of what's happening in terms of low wage, what's happening in kind of the low wage cycle. And it's just, you know, how do we break out of that cycle? Yeah, hold on. Um, are you still seeing my screen? Yeah. Oh. Did I lose? We lost the presentation mode. You lost the presentation mode, so now you see. Uh, are you back? Are we back? There we go. Perfect. And you are in the map of growing cities. Yep. Okay. Great. Yeah. So I'm happy. We can switch uh, gears and now talk to the other side of the equation, unless you want to open to questions on this, or do you want us to go? Let's go on, on to the let's go on to the workforce piece of it. Okay. Uh, great. All right. Um, okay. So this is yeah. The, I'm going to try to summarize this other piece on on kind of what are the trends um, that we're seeing on the workforce side, right? How do we help people? take advantage of the opportunities that we can create uh, based on the, on, on, on the diversification and complexity of your, of your industries. And, you know, it, it really is the supply side of the equation and it's 
it's you know the 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 motivation of all of us here right and and what we um what we uh, let, let me tell you a little bit of what we saw before the crisis and how we think this this a bit has has changed right because the question that we're trying to solve for i don't think fundamentally changed even after this crisis which is you know this pervasiveness of uh, of low wage work and the the precariousness of the, that work before this crisis we estimated that 53 million americans uh, were low wage they made on average less than 16 dollars an hour uh, which is you know we 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 had the data for every city based on the uh, the cost of living but that equals 44 percent of the workforce uh, and this varied by city from 30 percent of your uh, workforce to 62 percent of your workforce being being low low wage and these workers what we found is something that we just um you know is consistent with the literature which is that that those workers in the lowest quintile it tended to uh, cycle from job to job without seeing much wage growth. And right. even if we look here at that middle quintile, middle wage workers who make $19 to $24, you know, 63% of them, when they transition from work, they tended to make less or the same. So in a, in a way, it kind of reinforces this, this sense that the middle class is, um, is, is shrinking. The second trend that we've been seeing for, for, for a while is of people dropping out of the workforce, right? We were, we were at some of the lowest labor participation rates in history, particularly for men. One out of five men without a high school degree is out of, of the workforce. And again, we saw a small blip when the market was really tight for four years, but really this has been a consistent downward trend that of course has been hit even worse recently. And, and the forces at play um, however, that have led to the kind of precariousness and the low quality of, of low wage work have been at play for, for, for 40 years, you know, and they've been here before the crisis, will be here um, after the crisis, which are, you know, kind of wage stagnation at the low end, this lower economic mobility. And what David Otter, which did the research behind this graph, has described this barbellization of the labor force, right? The bifurcation of jobs between low wage and, and high wage and this erosion of the middle class jobs where we've created this you know, two tier economy um, where you know, we have an upper echelon of, of high paying, high skilled jobs that have security, benefits, stability, and an opportunity to move and a second tier of, of low wage workers who like the social networks, the resources, the knowledge, the skilling um, to move out of low wage work. And look, low wage work is always going to exist, but you know, we. We don't want it to be a life sentence. So um, now these forces at play that you discussed and, and, and your upscale report really makes evident, um, you know, are, are, are in a way positive forces, right? That just have affected these folks in a dramatic way. Automation, digitization, um, along with kind of the rise of contract work, you know, um, they will continue to be at play and creating this bifurcation unless we actively are able to move people into this middle skill and create more of these middle skill jobs. But while we have been having this kind of intense transformation of the economy, you know, we, um, our investments in, in helping people upgrade their skills, transition to better jobs, you know, let alone any incentive to create better jobs have dwindled at the same time. We spend, you know, a fourth of what, um, of what the, the OECD um, spends in, in training, we spend a fourth of what we used to spend in the 1970s. So, uh, which is why I'm really excited at the fact that you will be, um, you know, have the opportunity to really kind of turn this around. Um, and that is happening at the same time, let me go back to this, and again, this reinforces what, uh, what Upskill Houston report showed, that the digit, at, you know, the funding for helping people transition is at an all time low. Well, the need for these digital skills at every level of work, low skill, middle skill, has increased in every, in every, uh, in every job category. And that's partly so, because, and, and that's partly because technology is being embedded in the workplace at an accelerating rate, which means people are going to have to learn how to work aside beside technology in a very different way than we've had to in the past. Yeah, and 
go back to in a bit around our policy is is can we get and can we help companies stay attached to their employees at this time of crisis so that as this transition that was happening at already an accelerated pace and has accelerated in a COVID world, that firms can carry and educate and reskill their workers um, as they transition their business models at an accelerated pace. Because at the end of the day, you know, the more that that happens inside of the, the firm, uh, the better for, for, for workers and the economy as a whole. But this is a real challenge uh, right now. So, you know, we were worried about these trends when we were at 3% unemployment and, you know, uh, and the precariousness of work creating these two Americas. But, um, and we knew at the time that, you know, any shock was likely to hit the most vulnerable with, uh, with increased severity. We just, you know, we're not expecting the size and the nature of this shock, which was a double whammy for vulnerable workers that tend to be clustered in those industries that have hit the hardest, like hospitality and and face-to-face -face, um, industry. So, and, and, and also populations that don't have the support to actually help them navigate in terms of what we're seeing on the screen right now is how would you move from being a cashier to a, you know, a stock clerk, an order filler without the support of the employer and some other things? Right, right. And, and, and this is why we're trying to get creative, but worried about these trends and, and, and kind of the decreased mobility, particularly on the lower end, is that we did this other line of work um, that I'll just briefly show these two slides that show, you know, some of the output, which was we used um, data from the CPS and looked at job to job transitions over 150,000 transition, you know, 8 million, um, a sample of 8 million folks. And we looked at, you know, everybody, every month, the, the survey looks at the changes in employment. So it tends to capture lower wage folks and try to understand what are the transitions that we're seeing? So again, we're seeing, uh, you know, low wage workers transition more often, but we're always also able to see which occupations tend to transition to what other occupations and which of these are upward transitions and lower transitions that, uh, uh, that we can use to help people navigate their, their career path in this location or when they want to, you know, move to better opportunities. And we thought it was important to look at actual transitions versus skill similarities and other uh, proxies because this is really what's, what, what's, what's happening, right? And what you see here is where we looked at, we created this mobility index for every occupation to see, you know, whether uh, transitions out of this occupation tended to be upward or lower at what extent. And what, what we did is just looked at, you know, if you look at a very low wage occupation like Cokes and they make, you know, $12 an hour, the Cokes who tend to transition out of a $12 an hour uh, occupation tend to go to a $13 occupation. So anything that's upward is above that $13, right? So that's the blue and the, the, the orange is, um, is, you know, uh, a downward transition. And, you know, we, we're hoping that this data can help, um, can help folks navigate and see a sense of possibility of what transitions are actually possible because other people have, um, have, have, you know, that's a well-trodden path. And, and Marcella, the the employer, yeah. And Mar Marcella, and that would benefit, you know, an effort like Upskill Houston because then you could begin to construct the pathways and the skill paths that would support people making the, those upward transitions with good career guidance and coaching but also partnering with our education system to help folks acquire those skills, correct? Yeah, yes. And where, where our research is going and we're, you know, excited about the possibility of applying this to Texas is, is how, you know, collaborating with Burning Glass, we now only not have these one-off transitions, but we can have a trajectory. So we can look at the, um, at the probabilities of certain occupations and the reskilling interventions that can help you make that leap because at the end you know we want people to be able to escape that you know low wage occupation um and 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 find the stepping stones to to higher wage and, um, and you're yeah. also looking for those stepping stones aren't you because to your point how do you make sure that there's always a progression moving people up as opposed to backsliding into another you know bottleneck or you know hamster wheel yeah and here's where you work alongside companies right because there's a bit of what you can do with the individual choosing 
and also how can companies help create some of those stepping stones that I think sometimes uh, inadvertently have have uh, have uh, have been squeezed in yeah. in because you know, a good example for a company would be how do you diversify the skill set of someone at that entry level so that they could play multiple different roles. I think Costco has been acknowledged for helping its cashiers also build skills doing kind of some stocking and some other things so that they then have much more capability rather than specialization. Well, yeah, and it's not, you know, it, this is a great example that you present there because in a way, when we looked at an economy and what makes an economy click, you need specialized knowledge, right? That's what allows you to have the increased complexity of, of these industries. And specialization is, is great in terms of like what organizations and firms do is bring our little individualized diversified knowledge and put it together to create, you know, a complex product, kind of the way that an orchestra works, right? And that's the, 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 the wonders of what the firm does. Uh, I think that, that what, what Costco did and other retailers that tend to have the, you know, their reputation saying, well, you know, is we have all this low wage work, does it have a potential or whatnot, is, is, is as you said, think if they wanted to pay people more, they needed to have those folks be more productive. And to make them more productive, in a way, you need to give them more decision rights, you need to give them more responsibility, you need to, right? So, I think the catch line too, which which Zainab uh, Thon and her research on you know good jobs uh, really points to, is that it's not as simple as just like oh I want to increase wages. It's like the whole um, business strategy of trying to create um, better jobs within with with within some of these uh, of these industries that um, that can have low pay jobs. Doesn't they, they don't need to be. Um, low skill jobs and in that transformation you're making jobs more interesting and more fulfilling for people but you also are able to 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 get more productivity out of them to warrant getting paid more so that's ideally what you want there's a bit of of you know regulation that can create more of a of a playing field um, around the minimum but I think it's it's business operations you know and strategy that can really you know help uh, help that investment and help those workers transition along with, with the demands of the market in a way that can become more productive. Um, and that I think is the challenge of, of our times. And, and this, this last slide that I wanna show you here is, is a bit on the firm's perspective, right? Is to say, how when I think of the talent that I need, how can I think more expansively around who could fill those jobs, right? This is an in-demand occupation, like network computer system administrators. And of course, it's not surprised to anybody that most of the people who tend to transition to that job are computer scientists, right? But maybe you wouldn't have predicted that, you know, your printer machine repairer also is, uh, has successfully transitioned to this or customer service representative. And, you know, only one transition from that, you are in pretty low wage jobs, right? So we hope that also as firms are thinking, you know, and more so in, you know, in the, uh, in, in pre-COVID times, we're struggling to recruit, and that's some people with these digital skills. Um, the idea of with a little bit more knowledge, both from the market and their own operation, of who tends to be good at that job, they might not just be trying to compete with the Googles and the Facebooks to try to get the cybersecurity experts, but they might look inside of their company at who, in you know, tends to successfully transition and might be worth investing in um, in internal training. And, and, and to that point, you know, in many cases, some of the, the barriers are, you know, believing people need a computer science degree in order to play that role. And what you're describing is knowledge capabilities and skills that allow folks to play that role. And how do we help employers begin to articulate those differently so that they can, we can actually create different pathways for that? Right, right. And, and again, s similarly to the to the bullet painting and this network methods, all that they give you is what we see in the outside world. Then you get to understand why is it that this, these folks have done it successfully and might allow you to think, you know, how do you kind of can creatively facilitate that to create a win-win. Um, a and that's what we tried this network where we're trying to answer. If somebody from a, you know, steel worker loses his job, um, is he likely to become a plumber and make $100,000 a year than a computer engineer, right? Not everybody is going to make that path, but there are paths that are closer um, and have been 
you know, by, 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 by history, we are, you know, of the uh, transitions that are made, that we can try to understand why and try to facilitate the ones that are upward. No, and, and there are a couple of questions in, in, in the Q&A, and one is really about, you know, are companies beginning to provide training where, you know, it's resulting in certification and experience so that they become externally transferable or, you know, people can do external transitions. And I think, you know, where you're coming from is employers play an increasingly greater role in terms of, you know, working with its workforce, but both to internally capture them, but also help people find pathways into other adjacent yeah. And this is where organizations like yours and other places that link people from similar industries that share workers can actually work together toward this because in a way, part of the narrative around the kind of what we've called a you know, low skill equilibrium that we've ended up because there's not great data, but the data that we have shows that internal in, in training inside of firms has been going down. And in a way, is because you know people are like, well, if I train, then they get poached, and I'm the sucker who trained, right? But if everybody trains, then everybody benefits. A little bit, that's the kind of work council European model that you know, it, whatever. It's been done for 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 a hundred years. So there is a forced collaboration among schools, private, you know, universities, and and whatnot. And in the U.S., I think we need to create it in these types of forums that you create to say, okay, well, if we all did it, we will all benefit. But if you know, in every crisis, people start cutting those programs, then you end up, you know, if you're the one who does it, you're the only sucker who does it. So it really does require a cohesive commitment. And at the end of the day, also, workers want to be in places that invest in them, but it's hard in this environment, where all our accounting rules, all of our incentives are, you know, against labor pro capital. So it, I think you need to disrupt that to get back to a high skill equilibrium. And it, it takes everyone. It doesn't just take the reskilling organization. It takes the companies being willing to have those conversations in a very invested way um, as an industry. No, and as you know, what we've tried to do is put the employers first in trying to create kind of this demand-driven approach, which is, you know, how do we collectively do it so everyone's benefiting from it? Um, and I see we have a question, what are the funds available for training from the state of Texas to which she's referring? So there are a couple things and I'll answer that because that's probably more in my domain than it is yours, Marcella. But if there are other questions, people should feel free to put them in the Q&A. Um, so there are a couple sources for what we're looking at. One, you know, as we've had previously, the Texas Workforce Commission has Skills Development Fund where education partners like community colleges and Texas State Technical College can partner with employers to help develop, you know, either entry level skills or folks reskilling. And then there was a recent announcement by the governor where he's allocated about $118 million to the Texas Higher Education Coordinating Board to really begin to look at, you know, various ways to support students, particularly just under kind of 50 million focused on reskilling opportunities of folks that have been displaced by the pandemic uh, and then partnering with education employers. How do we help reskill folks that have some college, no degree and other things into those roles? And so that, I think that's in the, we're in the process of trying to get some of those things worked out. And I know uh, Commissioner Keller uh, is actively thinking about how to create this kind of education workforce connection and has been partnering closely with uh, Chairman Daniel of the Texas Workforce Commission. So I think those are some of the things that we're gonna see in the coming months where we'll have opportunities to kind of reinforce what I think you're sharing, Marcella, which is how do we be much more intelligent about the architecture of creating pathways and then partner differently with industry and education? Right. So let me let me move on to a couple of again. You asked us how we have pivoted ourselves to to look at uh, at how these methods and these ideas can be relevant to to today's environment. Um, and let me pass it to Ian to talk a little bit of what what we've been uh, working on there and how it applies to QC. And Ian, I just want to Ian, I just want to kind of note we're about five minutes out from kind of hitting the noon hour. All right. Okay. I, I, uh, let me breeze through this. I'm, I'm, it's something I'm excited to share because uh, it's a visualization that, that we launched yesterday and it, it came out of work uh, and conversations that go back to, you know, March and, and when uh, COVID was kind of breaking in the United States. And uh, what, uh, you know, we were talking to different city and, and state leaders 
Uh, one of the points that Marcel emphasized was uh, that uh, as the pandemic unfolded, we were going to start to see a lot of uh, you know weaknesses in in the economy and in uh, in the nature of work. And, but it would also kind of create the political impetus maybe to to address some of these now. Uh, and, and so, you know, going to the point about what uh, what is quality employment? Uh, how do people have pathways uh, upward? What does it mean to be attached to uh, to work and to to kind of invest in work and, and job quality? Uh, we wanted to create a metric that uh, it was very detailed that we could look at cities across the United States and sectors across the United States, uh, but also something that cap captured a worker's um, connection to, to their employer. Uh, so we, we thought that low wages were, uh, you know, obviously an important assessment of job vulnerability. Uh, in addition, we also estimated the proportion of people in each industry uh, and in each city that were offered health care by their employer. Uh, kind of as an indicator of employers' investment in their employees, uh, and which we know correlates with all kinds of other measures of job quality, like paid time off, training, and relevant to this discussion, uh, promotion pathways. Uh, so I'd encourage people to, to, to check out this interactive. Uh, and you know you can use it to see things like, uh, if we go to the next slide, um, the, the, the breakdown of, of job vulnerability uh, across different sectors and, and for different cities and states. Um, you know, uh, you discover things like uh, Houston's rank, uh, you know, in this job vulnerability uh, isn't great, not terrible either. Uh, 76th most vulnerable out of 379 metropolitan areas. But really, it's the sector view uh, that I think is the most revealing and that can start to bring some questions. Uh, just for example here, I, I mean, I'm no expert on the construction industry. Uh, but if I'm looking at uh, Houston and Texas and, you know, with respect to the rest of the country, uh, I'm more wondering a little bit uh, uh, what's going on here. And, and so we, we would just encourage people to, to check it out and, and um, see whether they can use it to, to start to ask some of these questions. And just to, to finish, and we can talk, uh, again, these are things that we've put in our workforce of the future. There's some examples of the kind of initiatives right now that we think can maintain the, the attachment between employers and employees taking advantage of both federal dollars and incentives and uh, um, again, innovative policies that can help in this moment. And we, you know, we're happy to talk about these or, or, or send you stuff where we we're talk more in detail. Um, but just one example around this strategic employee sharing uh, where, where our transitions data can inform, right? There are a few industries that are growing uh, many more that are contracting, can, can places really help companies come together and say, we know, and this is data from Houston, there's a demand for stock clerks. Stock clerks tend to, um, you know, come from stock movers, retail salespersons, you know, cashiers and whatnot. And the red ones are ones that are contracting in Houston and blue are, you know, growing. So can we create the collaboration where if Macy's is following 100,000 workers and Amazon is growing you know, 100,000 workers, can we get together and try to transition these workers so that, again, they stay attached? And this is an example of if I look for stock clerks, I know which industries they actually currently exist that might be contracting and which ones are growing. So I might not want to recruit from grocery stores, but from general merchandise stores or department stores, those are contracting, right? And again, we are leveraging burning glass data here and we're trying to make this data public but hopefully very soon um, and so that it can allow for firms to to really collaborate in in solving these big public uh, problems and yeah. i know we're on time but i wanted ian to at least show a couple of the pictures what this picture looks for for houston and again we can provide these um for people to you know to to read them and absorb them and these are very preliminary of course but we wanted um, we wanted to apply some of this to what's what's happening in the city. Sure, yeah. the figure shows employment changes over the over the last few months in in some of the key sectors. Uh, as you can see, some of them are uh, relatively small changes, even an increase in the finance and insurance sector, uh, oil gas extraction, as well as the related support activities. Um, you know, have have declined and, and are not really yet showing signs of uh, recovery. Uh, you know, I'm sure I'm not breaking news to anyone, and when I say that Houston's outlook will depend greatly on the 
on the global demand for global economic activity and, and global demand for energy. Um, you know, on the other hand, there's uh, these locally traded sectors uh, in Houston that depend obviously greatly on public health protocols uh, and the ability to, to deal with COVID. Uh, employment there, though, has been hardest hit. Uh, again, probably not surprising anyone to say that accommodations, food services, hospitality sector, uh, other services, laundry, barbershop, beauty salons, uh, have been hardest hit, but are showing signs of recovery. Um, yeah. And, uh, you know, here we're showing similar data, but we're showing it with respect to the size of these employment size of these sectors uh, in Houston. Uh, biggest employer is, is government. Uh, many of the job losses there have come from state and, and local government and their educational services. Uh, and, and again, uh, most of the job losses are not coming uh, from the key tradable sectors, the ones that really drive growth. Uh, nonetheless, the, the job losses there that, that have happened can be significant because uh, these are high paying industries uh, that have knock on effects for, for other uh, locally traded services and for the, the economy at large. Uh, here we're showing changes in job postings uh, recently. And actually what we're starting to see here is recovery. Blue is a growth in jobs postings. Uh, so uh, take construction, for example, uh, compared to before the pandemic, you're actually seeing more jobs postings now than you were previously. Uh, and that's because people are now hiring back uh, construction workers that were, were previously laid off, similar in, in logistics and hospitality. Uh, but as you can see, it says mining there, but really that's uh, uh, a catch-all for, for uh, oil and gas. Uh, and, and as you can see there, the uh, job postings are, are still down as they are in manufacturing. And I think this is to show an example that there is specificity and you can't just say healthcare. Some things are growing in healthcare, some things are contracting and that this kind of data, which is changing and it's gonna to continue to change with COVID, right? Like this contraction, might, we might contract again, other things might grow, but firms are very actively changing their business models. And I think the more responsive we can be and trying to keep you know, uh, people attached, the, the the better we're going to be in trying to recover. Um, the last slide I wanted to show, uh, Peter, because we will leave this for another conversation, a lot of more the, the tactical things is, but we were trying to test some of the industries that might be sources of growth as things reshuffle, as there's onshoring, you know, you guys have a budding and, and really uh, exciting aerospace industry, pharma, and, and just to give examples, like if we, if these industries were to grow, what are the implications for labor, for reskilling and whatnot? And that's the kind of data that we, we do hope to provide. Um, we didn't get a chance to talk about the reskilling journey and, and what, what is, when you, we think about reskilling, how to take the needs of the most vulnerable workers. But again, you have access to all of that. And this is something that uh, Harrison's and others have been, you know, know very deeply that what works, you know, it, the needs are different of the people who need it the most and the current reskilling system is not really aligned to their needs. And sometimes very small changes and, and design choices make a big difference in, in people's ability to access and benefit from, from the reskilling infrastructure. Yep. And, there's one last, and there's one last question here really yeah. related to what topics should someone who's doing job training could teach students to you know, upskill internally and externally and I suspect it would be like, you know, focus on kind of technology, like the basic business productivity software, Excel, you know, PowerPoint, Word, build a kind of a continuous learning mindset in people because they're going to have to continue to do that. Um, but, you know, that was one of the questions. But I think, you know, if you're trying to future proof people in that pipeline that you shared, you know, it's probably thinking about some of those digital skills and some of those you know, cognitive and essential skills that are going to be successful in the, the long run. And then we can figure out the technical ones based on some of the analysis you provided. No, for sure. And I think it, it confers very much of what you found that there is this consensus around these, you know, 21st century skills. And, and but there is, you know, also the, the, that what we are trying um, and, you know, and, and to these general skills, there's one point that we try to st stress around, you know, self-efficacy, which yeah. is something that some of us take for granted, but it's the sense of, of your belief that you can do things. 
And when you're someone that has been a, you know, BC student and told all your life that you can't learn, getting back to reskilling and, and, and believing that you can conquer new skills is hard, but it's teachable and it's possible. But we just have to acknowledge that that is a barrier. Um, and, you know, at the end of the day, like you said, uh, there is so much insight and data on each of these pieces. And what we're trying to do is simply add our bit of, you know, methodological rigor in some of these buckets, but it's just to have them talk to each other, yep. uh, right? Uh, of your demand side and, and the industries that are thriving and that you want to thrive affect the occupational mix of your city, how you create pathways for people um, to access those opportunities have to be very purposeful. Um, and, and we, and I think our data shows that there's more opportunity, but you need to kind of make it explicit and create those pathways. And again, you need a responsive reskilling infrastructure. And these are two little gray boxes that are huge gray boxes, which is around, you know, firm labor le uh, level behavior and operational changes and, you know, the, the, uh, um, the institutional reforms. But I think trying to see the whole picture and align it is what will make, uh, a, a, you know, a, a better use of, of resources at a time where they are scarce. No. So Marcella, Ian, thank you so much for joining us. It's been a pleasure to have you with us today. I know we're probably going to continue our work together going forward, uh, partly because we need this kind of data and analytics that you've provided. Um, and as our audience will see on their screens, uh, we've listed some important resources about today. Um, and, you know, as we begin, we'll continue to, you know, advance kind of these forms going forward. We're in the process of working on kind of the great skills that veterans can bring to the workplace. And as additional forms are scheduled, we'll send out notice so that you can register online. So thank you very much for being here today. And we look forward to seeing you again in the near future. Have a great day. Thank you.